is the radius of the Earth required for the explorations on this channel? It's a common accusation against globe Earth folks in the flat Earth debate. You guys just presuppose a sphere with radius 3959 miles, and then all your math works out. More specifically, I've been accused of requiring an R value for the explorations on my channel. The accusation isn't that spheres have a radius. Of course all spheres have one. Rather, the accusation is that I'm presupposing the very specific radius of 3959 miles as the starting point, and then attempting to prove the Earth is a sphere. This is a form of circular argument, starting with the thing I'm trying to prove. So the purpose of this video will be to go through all 20 of my explorations and ask if the radius of 3959 miles is baked in. When I entered the Flat Earth debate back in spring of 2008, there were only two models under consideration, a flat Earth, looking more like a pizza than a basketball, versus the common globe Earth. Since then, I've learned about some other concepts, such as a concave Earth. With regards to the flat Earth, there are other proposed models other than the most common one of the AE map, with the North Pole in the center and the Antarctic ice wall along the outer circumference. There are square maps and diamond maps and Pac-Man maps where the sun and moon sweep east to west before reappearing on the other side. One thing all these flat models have in common is that the sun, moon, and stars are local which means they're constantly getting either closer to the observer or further away. The only exception would be an observer at the north pole of the AE map, with the sun, moon, and stars traveling in circles around that point. And this is an important distinction. Even if the sun, moon, and stars are thousands of miles up, this is a shorter distance than the size of the flat Earth. This means that the distance between the Flat Earth observer and any celestial body is getting either closer or smaller, closer, or bigger for further away. In the globe Earth model, regardless of the size of the Earth, there are three important aspects. First is that all celestial bodies are very far away from the observer, many Earth diameters at least. The implication for this aspect is that no celestial body gets closer to or further from an observer. Second is that as the Earth rotates on its axis, which causes observers to see different areas of the celestial sphere, including sun and moon, like a camera panning on a swivel head. And third is that the surface of the globe Earth is continuously sloping, and different observers at different latitudes see the celestial sphere at different angles, up is a local concept, and everyone's up on a globe is different from each other. So in my explorations, we will exploit these important distinctions between a flat Earth observer with fairly close celestial bodies and a globe Earth observer with extremely distant ones. The sloping, rotating surface of a globe can also be revealed by studying the heavens. I don't think very highly of straw man arguments. So I use the AE map for the flat Earth, which is by far the most common flat Earth model. But I want to emphasize that any flat Earth observer can substitute their own model and run their own numbers in performing the analysis portion of each exploration. So let's go through the current crop of 20 do-it-yourself explorations on my channel. In each exploration, let's see if I'm presupposing the R value of 3959 mile Earth radius. Because my focus today is only on the R value accusation, the rest of this video will only contain screenshots from the globe half of each exploration. Please note that each exploration contains a thorough analysis for flat Earth folks to compare their real world observations against different possibilities for the shape of the Earth. Let's start with six observations in my Equinox playlist. The Equinox is one date every six months where you can make a ton of quality observations, and the shape of the Earth can become very apparent. The azimuth of sunrise and sunset on the Equinox is a great place to start. Azimuth is simply an exact cardinal direction, such as north, south, east, west, given in degrees. For example, due east is 90 degrees. In the globe model, 
the sun will rise or set exactly 90 degrees east or 270 degrees west, no matter the size of the Earth. Next is the sunrise-sunset angle with the horizon on the equinox. Take, t- take time-lapse images of a sunrise and then measure the angle the sunrise makes with the horizon. I give details on how you can do this with your own gear. Then you can simply subtract 90 degrees minus your latitude. This works on the globe no matter the size of the Earth. Our third equinox observation is the angle of elevation of the solar noon sun. You can make your own solar clinometer out of a cheap plastic protractor. And the math is very easy. Just subtract 90 minus your latitude. Notice that this would work even if the globe were 50 feet wide. And yes, you can measure an angle from a curve to Jason. By far, my favorite exploration is tracking the path of the sun on the date of the equinox. The analysis was tricky on this one because the globe prediction didn't make sense to me. But it says that if the Earth were a globe, a sundial would trace a straight line path of shadows. I tested this out on a desktop globe and it worked, which means you don't need a sphere 3959 miles in radius. Next, we have the number of hours of sunshine on the equinox. Equinox is Latin for equal night, and the globe prediction is about 12 hours, slightly more, because of the way we look at the sun. The globe geometry is easy. The day-night terminator line slices through both poles. This is true regardless of the size of the Earth. Last in our equinox explorations is the wagon wheel effect with sunspots, if you could spot any on that date. This phenomenon, technically called the change in parallactic angle in astronomy, relies upon globe observers standing on a sloping surface. As the Earth turns, their perspective changes, giving the impression that the Sun is turning like a wheel, regardless of the Earth's size. Next, we have four observations tailored for the December solstice. In the globe model, the December solstice is when the North Pole is tilted away from the Sun. In the Flat Earth model, this produces some very interesting day-night Terminator line effects. The first exploration is a modified take on the solar noon angle of elevation of the sun. If the globe Earth is tilted 23.5 degrees, then the solar noon sun will be 23.5 degrees southward from where it was on the equinox. The math is pretty straightforward based on your latitude, plus the tilt of the Earth's axis and it works regardless of the radius of the Earth. Next, we have the azimuth of the sunrise or sunset of the December solstice. There are a lot of folks in the Flat Earth debate, but to date, I'm the only one I know of to work this specific analysis using my own homegrown diagrams with equations I derived myself. Please notice that the radius of the globe Earth is one, making a unit circle which means I'm not using the 3959R value here either. Next is the path of the sun on the December solstice. Again, this is a variation of the one we did on the equinox. On the December solstice in the globe Earth model, the path the sun traces in the sky will be 23.5 degrees southward from the one it traced on the equinox. And if you do the geometry, you discover the globe model will produce a hyperbolic pattern of shadows using a simple sundial. Again, I tested this out using a desktop globe, and it worked just fine, meaning that this exploration should work regardless of the radius of the Earth. This next one is a fun one, measuring the geometry of a quarter or full moon on the solstice. In the globe model, since the sun lights the moon and the sun's really far away, a quarter moon means a perfect 90 degree angle, and a full moon is a 180 degree angle. This means that the solstice quarter moon will be three months out of phase with the equinox sun, plus or minus up to five degrees. Since we're dealing with angles, not size, this analysis should bear fruit, regardless of the size of the Earth. All of the December solstice explorations can also be done on the June solstice, but the poles are reversed, so globe observers will experience things a bit differently. One interesting aspect 
is that the day-night terminator is still a perfect great circle on the globe, while on the flat Earth model, the sun now acts as a spotlight. Now we get to the oldest videos on my channel, from the incomplete series known as Flat Earth Experiments, launched on April Fool's Day in 2016. When complete, the series will cover the sun, moon, and stars. Measuring the angular size of the sun is a fun project, and you can use a solar filter or build your own solar pinhole observer with cardboard and foil. Folks in the Flat Earth debate love to talk about perspective, and the first rule of perspective is that things that are closer to you appear larger, and vice versa. Which means that in the globe Earth model, the sun should stay the same size all day when properly viewed through a solar filter to eliminate glare. This applies regardless of the size of the Earth. The angular speed of the sun across the sky is a fun exploration to try. In the globe Earth model, the sun moves at a constant rate across the sky since it's based on the Earth's rotation. But in the flat Earth model, this rate should change with the sun's distance to the observer and trajectory towards or away, similar to watching cars on a racetrack. And since we're measuring angles, this exploration will work regardless of the R value of the globe Earth. The path of the sun is always a favorite, so here's my first version of this exploration, which uses a simple shadow stick sundial and will res de deliver results year round. I even developed a homegrown formula for globe Earth observers to predict the angle of elevation of the solar noon sun, which doesn't contain the value 3959 anywhere in it, as it's only about angles. Shape and features of the sun covers several aspects of sun geometry. There are some folks in the flat earth debate who argue that the sun is actually some other shape than a sphere. So I did some analysis on what a disk would look like from various angles with some homegrown math. A circular disk doesn't appear as a circle to most observers. As you can see in the thumbnail, this exploration also includes the wagon wheel sunspots analysis, which depends on latitude, not Earth's radius. Next, we ang analyze the angular size of the moon. Most of these explorations include a method for calibrating your gear, so you can compare apples to apples images. The math will give you an angular size, even if you're just using a prosumer camera with a decent zoom. According to the rules of perspective, objects that are closer appear larger, but globe folks know the moon's really far away through its path across the sky and thus won't appreciably change size. I said appreciably on purpose, as we'll see in a few slides after some guy yells at me. Next is the speed of the moon across the sky. In the globe model, the moon appears to move due to Earth's rotation, which is an angular phenomenon, not a size one. We've got some homegrown formulas for you to use in your analysis, along with my favorite activity, unit analysis. There's no mention of the radius of the Earth in this exploration either. For a season, a bunch of folks were obsessed over Foucault pendulums, so I prepared a method for folks to build their own. It's a lot harder than you think, but easier than building a Cavendish apparatus. The analysis, which I developed myself with no help from NASA or anyone else, initially used the variable r to stand in for the radius of the Earth, but that variable canceled out. Thus, my final formula works regardless of the actual r value for the planet Earth and is merely dependent on latitude and hemisphere. Or maybe it's just the jet stream. This last one is an interesting one, finding solar noon multiple different ways. The math is pretty fun because it just uses units of time, so anyone who knows arithmetic can tackle it. And at the end, I give an application for how you can use the solar noon angle of elevation of the sun with multiple observers. Globe observers merely know, need to know their latitude for the comparison, not the actual radius of the Earth, which is nowhere to be found. So, is the radius of the Earth required for the explorations on my channel? No. Oh, great. Here's that shouty guy coming after me yet again. This fellow certainly has a lot of stamina. I'll give him that. Okay, Mr. Man, what do you want this time? 
Uh, the exploration where we measured the size of the moon throughout its path, you say? Oh, there was an optional bonus section for folks who have high quality optics and clear skies. And it turns out that as the globe Earth turns, observers get very slightly closer to the moon when the moon crosses the local meridian. Busted. Turns out I'm using the radius of the Earth. But this was only to get a size change estimate in percent. Okay, guilty as charged. But I do have a weaselly way out, as I always do. The key is in red. Is the radius of the Earth required for the explorations on this channel? No. No. Please consider becoming a member of the Flat Earth Math channel, one of the few places on YouTube where Globe Earth folks engage Flat Earth folks with kindness and logic. Show off your member badges, where the solar eclipse marches towards totality the longer you're a member. Use these exclusive member emojis and comments when you kindly rebuke your opponents in comments and live chat. And special thanks to my channel supporters for your memberships and super chats. I truly appreciate your kindness and generosity, helping make this channel a thriving place to discuss the shape of the earth. And please, when engaging with folks in the comments and discussion, please remember to be kind to each other. Bye.